Amen. <clears throat> I want to thank John for all the music that he has brought to us this morning. And, and to the angels and to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This morning, I want to continue looking on the family and looking at the first family. We've been looking, uh, my messages have been dealing with the family and the first family, which Adam and Eve, and I want to take you there to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, and there are questions that are asked to Adam and Eve that can be asked for, uh, can be asked as well to us. In Genesis chapter 1, God created Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 2, he instructed them. And in Genesis chapter 3, God tested Adam and Eve. And there are questions in chapter 3 that I want us to review. So if you're there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, we, we find the first question in verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? What is the first question? Did you hear the first question? Has God said? Do you know what God has said? That's the question that the serpent gives to Eve. Do you know what God has said? The most important question that you and I will face is, do you know what God has said? Do you know what the scriptures say? See, when, when you buy something, whether it's an appliance or a toy or even a game, almost every object that we purchase comes and sometimes folded really small with really small fine print are the instructions. Whether on how to change the battery, the bulb, um, play the game, turn it on, ch recharge it, whatever it may be. Sometimes you purchase something and there's, there are many instructions and it's such an easy thing that I've asked myself, they didn't need to print instructions. This is so basic, it's common sense. But yet there's still, the instructions are in there. Well, in the same way, you and I did not create ourselves. But we were created by the hand of God. And the instructions that God gave us are right here in, his, in the Bible, in the Holy Scriptures. These are the instructions for us. We did not create ourselves and, and God created us. Do we know then, if these are our instructions, do we know what God has said? We know what God has said. The serpent asked, has God said, do you know, are you sure what he has said? And if God has said it, friends, it must be important. Amen? Amen. Who am I to, to argue with the creator of this universe? But yet there is a new type of Adventism that I am seeing and I'm trying to match it with the scriptures and, ha and I'm having a hard time. There's a new type of Sabbath keeping that I'm seeing that I try to match up with scriptures and I don't find it. A new type of ministering to our youth, a new type of parenting, God, for help, God help our parents. A new type of parenting that I try to match it up with scripture or with Adventist Home and Child Guidance, and I have a hard time. Do you know what God has said? And notice there, Satan even suggests to Eve, has God said that you cannot eat of the trees of the garden? And Eve, right away, she knew that, that, that that's not what God had said. And friends, it is a dangerous thing to, to willingly step into a conversation with Satan. 
it is, you're putting yourself in the fire. You cannot compete. If he deceived one-third of perfect angels with no fallen generations, how will we compete? We'd be fools to go up and, and argue and debate with Satan. He would have us in a heartbeat. But she says, no, we may eat of every tree. He, you, you see, Satan is suggesting that she can't eat anything. And this is an approach that Satan even uses today in the church. That the church limits you and that you can't do anything. You can't smoke, you can't drink, you can't dance, you can't go to the show, you can't go to the club, you can't wear that, you can't do anything. It's the same approach. Has God said you can't do anything? But to live happy, to live happy, friends, you need boundaries. You need boundaries to live happy. Do you need boundaries in a marriage? For it to be a happy, successful marriage? Amen. A amen. Absolutely. I praise the Lord. There are boundaries. There are things that my wife, I do not want her to do, and vice versa. No, she is not to go out with somebody, even out for dinner by herself. No. That's the boundary. And vice versa. There are boundaries in a relationship. And God... God, as you come into a relationship with Christ, He primarily sets us free from the chains of sin and addiction. He sets us free. But anything denied by Jesus is something that is either harmful for us or that we can do without and do not need it to live a happy life. Jesus didn't come to give us a boring life. On the contrary, He says that He's that has, he has come to give us life in abundance and a joyful life. Church, do you know what God has said? It is not important always that we may not understand what he has said, but do we know what he says? There are times that I don't understand certain things that I read either in scripture or in spirit of prophecy, but God has said that. And so that leads to the next question there in, in chapter 3 and verse 9. After Adam and Eve have eaten, you see, they knew what God had said, but now they are hiding. And now the question comes from God there in verse 9, where Jesus is out walking in the monks in the garden. Then verse 9 says, Then the Lord God called Adam and said to him, What did he say? Where are you? Now, God knew where he was. We cannot hide from God. But, but yet, God asks, where are you? Where are you? The first question, what has God said? Since you know what God has said, where are you on what he has said? Where do you stand on what he has said? Not, do you know the Sabbath, but where do you stand on the Sabbath? Not, do you know it's wrong to cheat, but where do you stand on that? He didn't ask, do you know to love your enemies, but where do you stand on that? You must not just know what he says, but you must take a position on what he has said. Take a stand. The meditation in your bulletin is, is, is where Martin Luther took a stand. And, and he says, here I stand and I cannot do anything else. So help me God. So help me God. Where do you stand on what God has said? I love the example of Daniel's friends there when they asked them twice to worship the image, the golden image. And they said, even if God were to not save us, we're still not going to bow down. They didn't know that God was going to deliver them. 
They knew God could, but God didn't tell them, don't worry, boys, I'll take care of it. Would that have made it easier to stand? Of course. It would have taken no faith to stand if God would have whispered, don't worry, you ain't going to be burned an inch. It would have been easy to stand, but yet they did not know. And yet they still stood. We're not going to bow down to your image. And I don't think that this kind of, that this kind of courage has outgrown the church. The church has not outgrown the need for this kind of courage to stand on what God has said. Where do you stand on your principles? Where are you? God is asking. And where was Adam? Was he standing with God? No. Adam and Eve were standing behind the bush of excuses, wrapped around the aprons of ego. And you and I have been there. At one point or another, you and I have been there. Hiding behind the bush of excuses, wrapped in our aprons of ego. Whatever excuse it may be. Well, brother such and such does it. So? Doesn't matter. We have, it doesn't mean we have to do it as well. Or another excuse. Well, God understands you know, that I was raised in a rough home and, and I was raised with rough parents or I was raised by a single parent and God understands. God does understand. He understands that if He asks us to do something, He expects us to trust Him and to do it and to count on Him for support. <clears throat> to count on Him for support. One of my favorite excuses is, well, other Adventists are doing it or wearing it. And they're Seventh-day Adventists. One thing that I never forget, even up to this day, my mother would always tell us as, as we would go off to school, and I, and I was raised both in Adventist schools and public schools. And uh, of course, I expected to hear it going, to, going into public school. She would say, hardly remember you are not like these young men. You're different. You're always going to go against the current. You're always going to go against the grain. Do, do not be like them. Do not like the thing that they like. And so when I got the blessing of, of, of going to Valley Grande Academy, an Adventist um, academy, I'm like, great. And it was very very, very good experience for me. Yet my mom still did not stop. She said, remember, Harley, you're going to go against the current. I go, Mom, I'm going to an Adventist school. Remember, son. And even today, even today, the last time she was here, she was here last week for a constituency meeting here in Keene, Texas. How are things going in the church? How are things going in your life? Remember, son, you're not like the rest of the other pastors, you're different. It's something that, that, that is just embedded since my youth. And so we need to stop hiding behind excuses. I don't know how many of you have heard from your parents if Johnny jumped off the bridge, would you jump off also? Whenever we wanted to do something. But mom, they're going there. They're going to the show. They're going to... It's just a sleepover. Everybody is sleeping over at such and such person's house. So if everybody jumped over the bridge, would you just jump over the bridge? Of course, I hate it whenever she says that. Of course not, mom. I'm not going to jump over it. But here, God is asking, where are you? Where do you stand? Where do you stand? And we need to stop hiding behind the bush of excuses, wrapped, or wrapping ourselves with our own egos, with our own egos. And notice in verse 11, verse 11, 
after he says, So I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And now Jesus asks, what does he ask? Who told, Who told you you were naked? I didn't tell you you were naked. Who have you been what? Who have you been listening to? Who have you been listening to? Who told you that you were naked? Life is not about doing our own thing. We are either listening to the voice of God or listening to the voice of Satan. There is no such thing as, well, I'm just going to do my own thing for a little bit. When you do your own thing, you're listening to the voice of Satan. Because you're listening to self. And no one is doing their own thing. If you're not listening to the scriptures, then what are you listening to? If you're not reading the spirit of prophecy, then what are, are you reading? And, and I think that God is not pleased with his church because too many are listening to the wrong voices. And here, when the crisis came, who told you that you were naked? He asked. It doesn't matter how old you are, when crisis comes to your life, what voice do you listen to? What counsel do you listen to, do you seek? And there is no place in the remnant church for religion built on opinions. My opinion, as well as your opinions, mean nothing if we go contrary to the Word of God. We have a sure word from God. A sure word from God. We have a sure testimony of Jesus through the period of prophecy. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17 say, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and in instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete. May be complete. This is our instruction manual right here that we may be complete through thoroughly equipped for every good work for every good work so jesus so the question there do you know what god has says what god has said where are you on what he has said where do you stand on what god has said and if you're not standing on what God has said, well, who have you been listening to? Who have you been listening to? And we see there in verse 11, a second question where it says, who told you that you were naked? What does he ask? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? God knew that they had eaten. Why does he ask him? Have you eaten of the, of the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? You see, in, in order to overcome sin, you must focus on what you have done. You must focus and admit to your mistakes and to the sins that we commit. God is appealing to Adam to recognize what he did. Did he recognize it? No. Did you eat from the fruit? To recognize would be, yes, I did. I'm sorry, I did. But he doesn't do that. What does he do? right? The woman that you gave me, she gave me the fruit. But yet God didn't say, who gave you the fruit? He said, have you eaten? God wanted him to recognize his mistake. And Jesus here wants us to recognize when we've done wrong. Do you admit when you're wrong? Do you admit your sins to God? And praise the Lord that we admit our sins to God. 
and not to each other. Praise the Lord. When Arlene was about two years old, or a little bit less, Danny, being one year exactly younger, uh, Danny could enjoy his, what do you call it, baby years, baby time, in the crib alone. He could be there all day. He, he, whenever he's hungry, he let us know. He's dirty, he let us know. But put him back in there. Whenever my, my mother-in-law or my mother would want to come and carry him, you know, they want to carry, he would start fussing and crying. and Put him down. Ah, oh, he'd be comfortable. Arlene is the opposite. Arlene needed to be carried and wooed to sleep. Well, Danny had a crib and you, I'm not sure what they're called, but in the crib, besides the little mattress, there's a little wall that, that, that you can purchase that ties to the ends, kind of so their fingers won't go through the crib. And um, once in a while, you know, he would push that down and play Danny. But Arlene would love to come into, into, into their room, because they were sharing the room. She would like to come into the room and look for Danny, and she would pick up the little wall there that, or phone, I'm not sure what it's called. She would pick it up and look for Danny's fingers or toes. As soon as she would find one, she would pull it as far as she can, and guess what she did? Bite it. Mm. And I would be, at, well, I wasn't there most of the time, but my wife tells me, or sometimes if I was there in the evening, you would just hear the scream of Danny. And Arlene would, 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 would run another direction. And so then, yeah, that's right, she better. And so then, again, later on, either the same day or another day, she'd find maybe not his fingers, but his toes and bite it. And so one... Uh, one, one particular time, Salid brought Arlene into the room, sat her down on the bed, and said, Arlene, why, why is Danny crying? I don't know. Did, uh, did, 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 did you bite Danny? No. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that Salid and I have in common is that if there is anything more, no, there isn't anything more than we detest and hate is a lie, is a lie. And I think that was passed down from my mom and maybe from her mom too, because my mother would say, even if you did wrong, even if you went out when you were supposed to, you better tell me the truth. Because if I come to find out that you lied to me, and then she would throw in that clause and the truth always comes out, you're going to get it 10 times worse than what you're going to get it today. And so that was embedded in our mind, you know. If, if we wanted to make our mom mad or even sad, just lie to her. And so, so, so lead telling there, Arlene, now Arlene, are you, when you're not in trouble, we just want to know. You know, we, we weren't talking loud, she wasn't, you know, upset and... Um, and uh, no, no, I didn't, I didn't buy it. All right, then who did? My teeth, was her answer. <laughs> Can you hear Adam? No, Lord, the woman you gave me. Uh, come again, Arlene. Did you bite Danny? No. Then who did? My teeth did, but I didn't do it. <laughs> Friends, even at a young age, we don't like to admit or confess our mistakes, our situations, our problems. Our excuses, our excuses will not save us. Our excuses will not save us. Confessing and admitting to Jesus will. 
1 John 1, 9 is a promise for you and me. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a promise. That is a promise that when you goof, when you sin, when you stab Jesus in the back, when He comes to you and says, Have you eaten of the fruit? Have you held your tithe? Have you kept my Sabbath day? Have you been nice to your children? Do you love your spouse? Instead of coming up with excuses, we know in our heart of hearts, no, Lord, I haven't. And I'm sorry, and I want to confess my sins because you have promised that you are faithful to forgive me. And that should have been Adam's response. And there is no other safe place you can be than to letting Jesus know. There is no safer place. I want to invite you to turn to the book of Ezekiel as my closing text. No matter how far or where you are in your life, if you come to Jesus and confess and repent. See, Jesus is not like us. That whenever my children get in trouble, even though they confess, we thank them for being honest, but they still get in trouble. It doesn't get swooped under the rug. Jesus, well, actually, neither does sin. Sin did not get swept under the rug. Jesus paid for it. But Jesus is trying to avoid you paying for it. He already paid for it. There's no need for you and I to suffer the lake of fire, the second death that he already suffered. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse, verse 20. The soul that sins shall what? Shall die. These next verses are sobering verses. Please, please, please follow along or listen if you can. The soul whose sins shall die, the son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a wicked man turns... What does turns mean? Change. Repent. Repent. But if a wicked man turns from all, his, from all his sins which he has committed, keeps all of my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live and shall not die. Amen. 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 It doesn't matter how many sins, how bad your history is. Even, even if you are paying the consequences and you are in prison on death sentence, the state may not forgive you, but the heavenly kingdom will. And you shall surely live. Verse 22 says, None of the transgression which he has committed shall be remembered against him amen because of the righteousness which he has done he shall live notice that do i have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die says the lord god and not that he should turn from his ways and live but when a righteous now now notice this this is important especially for our young Adults, but when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? He's asking. Now it's reverse. Someone who's been righteous, someone who's gone through all the maybe Adventist schools, through all the AYs, through all the Sabbath school programs, they've been righteous in other ways and then they decide you know what i'm going to do my own thing for a little bit 
and they step out of the church. Either way, I've been an Adventist most of my life. What is verse 24? But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abomination that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered. Because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty, the sin which he has committed, because of them he shall die. Friends, if you can hear my voice, and if you're even in the kitchen right now, you see, Satan knows this text. He knows it. That's why he does everything to get people out of the church. And once they're out there living a life of sin that they know contrary to God, there's no guarantee that you're going to come back in the church. There is no guarantee. And Ezekiel is pleading, do not do that. Because all of your righteousness that you did will count like nothing. Like you, like you weren't righteous. Friends, that's a scary thought. That's a scary thought because I have family that were righteous. And right now they laugh at God and laugh at my work, at the church. I still pray for them because they can still turn. Let's not forget how the verse continues. Verse 25. It says, Yet you say the ways of the Lord is not fair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is it not my ways which is fair and your way which is not fair? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and dies in it, it is because of the iniquity which he has done that he did. Again, again, verse 27, he re he's repeating himself. When a wicked man turns away from the wickedness which he committed and does what is lawful and right, he preserves himself alive. What a perfect example than the thief on the cross. A thief all of his life, yet gave his heart to God. We don't know how long that thief la lasted on the cross. I don't think he died that same night that Jesus died. But for the rest of the hours or days that he hung on that cross, he surrendered his will and his life to God. And what did God say? I'm going to remember you. Not because of all the wickedness that you've done, because right now, this counts for you as righteousness. This counts for you as righteousness. So it is a dangerous thing, young people, and even older people, to step away from the church and thinking that you can come back. To begin with, we don't know the future. Only God does. And if you want to gamble with your salvation, I will pray for you. So God, so the, the scripture asks our early parents, do you know what God has said? And I ask the church, do you know what the scripture, do you know what God has told you? And if we do, where do we stand on it? Where do we stand on what he has said? And if we're not standing on what he has said, who have, been, who have we been listening to? What voices? Is it God's voice or Satan's voice? Who have we been listening to? And even if we have been listening to Satan and God and the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit asks you, have you eaten of the fruit? Let's admit Yes, Lord, I have, and I'm sorry. And forgive me and cleanse my heart. 
You know why David is called a man after God's own heart? Not because he never committed any sins, but because David always recognized his mistake. David never pointed, well, the people, you know, kind of made me, no, David always recognized and put his face in the ground and said, Lord, forgive me, for I have sinned against you. That's why he's called a man after God's own heart. And so I just want to read again. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He even loves me and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver makes of my troubles quickly an end. Oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. Can anyone relate to that? I must tell Jesus, and he will help me overcome the world, the victory to win. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. Even if you know what he has said, even if you know where you stand, and even if you have listened maybe to the wrong voices, when the Holy Spirit asks you, you must tell Jesus, friends. Because Jesus is just waiting to hug you, to take care of you, forgive you. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess, he is faithful and just to forgive us. He will not forgive us if we don't confess. He wants to so much, but he's just waiting for us to ask. To ask. You must tell Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we know what you have said. We know what scripture says. Lord, and we know where each one of us personally stands on what we know. Forgive us if we have not stood where we needed to stand. Forgive us, Lord, if we have heard other voices rather than your voice. But Lord, forgive us even more that when you convict us, when your spirit talks to us and appeals to us, and ask us, have you eaten of the fruit? That we come up with excuses. Forgive us, Lord. I ask that you bless every single soul here. That we may draw closer to you. And if when we have done wrong, we admit, not blame it on our parents, not blame it on our spouses, not blame it on our children, on our bosses, or anyone else. But Lord, I have done wrong. Forgive me and help me to get up and continue to walk the Christian walk. Lord, help us to tell you everything, to commune with you morning and evening and every day. We must tell Jesus, bless your church, bless your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to open your hymn books and stand with me as we sing hymn 485. 485. I must tell Jesus. Mm -hmm. 